Okay, so welcome to lecture 25. Today we're going to go on looking at the Josephson Junction. Um, and just to remind her, a Josephson Junction is a device that we showed has a pretty unusual um, relationship between current and the voltage applied with it. So what it basically was, and this is just another way of looking at it, it's a device in which when it's just the superconducting version, it can have a current flowing when there's no voltage across it. Okay? And then at a certain voltage that we call the critical, in some sense the critical current, sorry, at a certain current, which we call the critical current, it suddenly starts, the, needs a voltage to let it go, and that's basically when your superconducting bridge, in some sense, the Cooper pairs can no longer let the current flow, then it actually needs a voltage to drive it across, and this voltage begins from zero, and then it eventually goes up to the relationship that's the normal resist, r relationship for a resistor. And we went through a whole long derivation two lectures ago where we actually derived the system of equations that govern this device, okay? So remember, it's the same equations whether you talk about the Josephson junction where this re is related, to, or phi dot is related to the voltage, or whether you view the thing as a system of equations that comes from a damped and driven pendulum, okay? And so what we can do in our analysis is use the fact that this, we actually understand how a pendulum loom works very, very well, where this alpha is the damping, and this I is basically the driving, is basically how fast you're making the pendulum. You can have your hand and you can basically be swinging the pendulum. That's what I actually means. So these two are the constants that enter, and these are the equations that we are analyzing. And so in the previous lecture, I went in detail and did our normal analysis of where, you know, fixed points, when we have fixed points, when we don't have fixed points. And we showed that when I is greater than one, there are no places where we have fixed points. And that's actually what we're going to analyze. So that, that comes from the previous lecture, which I hope you'll actually look at or have looked at. And so what I'm going to do today is sort of go on, right? So if I is greater than one, there are no fixed points, how do you see that? Well, we see that y is equal, the fixed points occur when y is equals to zero, and if i is greater than one, the null line y equals to one minus sine theta is never zero. Okay, so that's the argument. So we're gonna look at this regime where we have no fixed points for a little bit more. And um, what we did in the last time is we basically proved that then you have a limit cycle. And the way we proved it is to actually look, and this is just another way of saying what I actually did in the previous lecture, we view the phase space, we basically made an infinite trapping region around the null line, we proved that it entered that, and because, remember I always said you have to be careful with infinite trapping regions, we got past the fact that we have an infinite trapping region by noting that you could identify phi and phi equals to two pi. It's easy to see if you view the thing just as a pendulum because um, phi equals to zero and phi equals to two pi are exactly the same physical state. You can see it directly from the equations by noting if you replace phi with phi plus two pi, um, you actually have the same set of equations. Okay, so it's a symmetry in your equations. And so what we did was we basically viewed the problem not on an infinite domain in phi, but rather on phi, we identify zero with two pi. And then what we did was, so it's basically orbits on a cylinder, and then the possibilities are basically one, you can have it librating, in other words, moving around in a cylinder, and libration refers to this motion of your pendulum, the tick-tock motion of your pendulum, and you can have rotation, which is the one where you go around like this, okay? And you can eliminate this for the case where i is greater than one because you have no fixed points, okay? So this type of motion, if you look at it, because trajectories don't cross, if you have to pull in the other trajectories, you're eventually going to get a fixed point. It's required by the structure of your trajectories. 
And because you've already proven that there are no fixed points, you, can, you can't have this in the case where i is greater than zero, so you can eliminate the possibility. So in the case where i is greater, sorry, when i is greater than one. So when i is greater than one, you can, you can have this possibility where you go round and rotate. And what I did at the end of last lecture is basically prove that there is at least one of these special trajectories that go round and rotate. Okay, there's at least one limit cycle. And the method of proof, it's a very, very important method of proof, so please go back to it, was basically to say, to use an argument that looks something like this. Okay, so I'll give you the very brief, the very brief version now. So what I did is basically to say, when I proved that there was um, a limit cycle, is I said, Let's put in our null line, which is this dotted line over here. Okay, let's make up the trapping region because everywhere above the null line, we always have this region where the arrows point down and cross that line. Everywhere below the null line, y dot is positive, so you're going to have a whole bunch of arrows that eventually point in into the strapping region. So we proved that the trajectory would eventually enter the strapping region. And so what we also did then is we said, let's identify 2 pi with pi. In other words, let's have this picture. And so how we proved that we would have a limit cycle is I said, fine, we know every trajectory is going to enter the strapping region. Let's start on the two extreme boundaries of the trapping region and define a map and this, was, this is why it's important. It's the beginning of the idea of a Poincaré map, right? A Poincaré map is the idea of you change your dynamical system from a continuous trajectory that you wanted to describe to a discrete jump. So the Poincaré map of, say, y at this point, or, or let's say, let's, sorry, let's start down here. Say you start with y1. The Poincaré map of y1 is the point that y reaches after 2 pi. Okay, so it's the image of y1 here at phi equals to 0 um, mapped onto the image what phi reaches after 2 pi. In other words, you start your trajectory, you integrate it around, and where it comes after 2 pi is the map of y. Okay, so that's the definition of Poincaré map. So if we do it for this, we can actually get an estimate of what trajectory looks like simply by knowing that arrows below the null cline point up and to the right, um, and arrows above the null cline point down. So this is the actual numerical trajectory that I plotted, and you can see it over there. Okay, so arrow below it curves up, above it curves down. It's always horizontal when it crosses the null cline, because that's basically the definition of the null cline. The tangent vectors are horizontal over there, because um, y dot is equal to zero. And so here we have it curves up, crosses horizontally, curves down, and so we had this image of the Poincaré map. So the P of Y1 is simply that red point, and because of the construction, it is always bigger than Y1. And then we had the other idea of Y2. We did the same thing. The P of Y2 that starts on the upper boundary goes down like this, and we found that it was always less than y2. Okay, and then we continued the game, and we said we can now take y1, or the p of y1, the p of y2, put them on this side, and repeat the exercise. Okay, so we take p of y1, we then divide, find the, the Poincaré map of the p of y1, we know that the trajectories never cross. So we know that this trajectory will never go above y2 and it will never go above y1. We know it will always get an answer and the answer will be sandwiched between the two previous ones. Okay, so there we have, and we can do the same thing with a p of y2. It is always above the p of y1 because the trajectories never cross. And so you go on Okay, and what eventually happens, you can see that the two, the things continues to sandwich each other, and you will always get 
uh, eventually you'll get to the point where you have a y star that if you integrate it for 2 pi, we'll always get to p of y star over there, and the two will be equal. And in some sense, that fixed point is your um, closed trajectory. Okay, it's a very, very clever argument, and it was made com especially concrete in the last lecture, so that's the reason why you should actually look at it. Um, but this should at least give you enough of an idea of um, why a periodic trajectory exists. And the sole thing you basic, you can show that this map, or you can simply see from this thing, because of the uniqueness of the trajectories of an ordinary differential equation, this map P of Y is continuous and differentiable, right? Because there's a continuous image of Y1 if you've integrated it to P of Y, and so it's a smooth function, and it also has the property that P of Y2 is less than Y2, and P of Y1 is greater than Y1, and so you can actually prove that there always exists a special Y star um, such that this thing is so, okay? And this is done in greater detail in the previous lecture. Um, what I want to do now is argue that uh, the proof is sufficient that was given in the last lecture. It was sufficient to prove that a closed trajectory exists. It was not sufficient to prove that the trajectory is unique. Okay, so the way it is structured. And so what I want to do now is simply show that the trajectory is in fact unique. Okay, so this is basically the proof that the trajectory is unique. The proof is approved by contradiction. We've proven that there is at least one trajectory. We're going to assume that there are possibly two and work out the consequences. And it's a very clever way of working out the consequences. Okay, so let's assume there are two places where the thing goes around and closes in on itself. In other words, the Poincaré map of the two pi is equal to the initial condition. And, and we're going to call the one an upper trajectory and the other one a lower trajectory. And then we're going to ask the question of whether this is possible. And we're going to show it results in absurd absurdity. Okay, so the way we do it is to make use of the energy potential. So you can remember when we were looking at the pendulum, um, we first had the conservative pendulum where there was no damping. And we showed how important that energy potential was when we actually added damping, okay? Once again, it's going to play a very important role, but this time we've added not only damping, but damping and driving. But once again, it's a usefulness proof. And it sort of underlies how important um, conservative systems are, even though they're a very small set of the possible systems that you can have. Okay, so the, remember the energy for a pendulum was 1 over 2y squared minus cos of 5. Okay, and what we're going to do is compute the energy, the change in energy, on a rotation. And the important thing is that if you have a closed orbit, this energy is dependent only on the coordinates of an orbit, and in a closed orbit you've gone around to exactly the same point, so we know what the change in energy is, it must be zero. Okay, so uh, compute the change of energy over one cycle, it dep is dependent on y and cos phi only, and so after one cycle, our delta E is equal to zero. But this, the fact that we have a concrete energy actually permits us to do the calculation, right? We must also have that this change in energy is, is the same as the integral expression, which is just simply the integral of d0 to 2 pi, dE d phi times d phi. And we can now work out what dE d phi is. It, along the trajectory, it's simply... Um, this thing d phi, because along a trajectory, remember, y is a function of phi. So it's y times dy d phi plus sine of phi. But from our differential equations, we can actually find out what dy d phi is. And the way we find that out is simply observing that y prime is equal to y, so dy d, um, dt or d tau, d phi d tau is equal to y, and dy d tau is equals to this thing. And if we divide the two equations, we get that dy d phi is simply equals to y prime over phi prime. And so we have an expression for dy d phi. Okay, so this expression for dy d phi 
we can then put back in over here. And the important thing to note is that we multiply it by y, so the sine of phi and this minus sine of phi cancels out, and so we all, here it, just here it is exactly, so I'll put in the steps. And so we can simplify this, and we get that the change of energy is equal to this constant I minus alpha times Y. Okay, so now we're in a position to put this back. We know that the, in, the change in energy should be zero. We know that we want to, work, so therefore this integral must be zero, and we can actually work out what the integral is. Okay, and so for any rotation, we're going to have the following to be true, right? We, I is a constant, so it's simply 2 times times I. We know this thing is equal to 0, so we have 2 pi I times alpha times the integral from 0 to 2 pi Y of phi d phi. Okay? So what this means, this integral from 0 to 2 pi, is the average value of Y for along the trajectory. In other words, this thing is simply alpha times the integral of y along this whole trajectory. Okay, so if you wanted to know what the average, what that integral is, it would simply be, in some sense, the average line between the oscillating orbit times 2 pi. Okay, and now the argument goes, if you happen to have two different trajectories, this thing must be, must be true for both of them, but that's totally impossible. Okay, because you have a constant on this side, and if the y of the upper trajectory is always bigger than the y of the lower trajectory, this integral is also going to be, the upper one is also going to be greater than the one for the lower one, can't possibly be equal, and therefore you can only have um, one orbit. Okay, so the orbit is unique. Okay, so we've managed to prove not only that our orbit is, exists, which we did in the previous lecture, but we now have uniqueness as well. And that's very important if you want to use this type of thing for a physical application, right? If you want to use it as a switch, which is its aim um, for computing, is then you at least want to know how many bits you're working with, right? Because a switch in computation physics represents either one or zero, right? And all the, the computational, all the phys, all the computer stuff is basically a whole combinations and ones and zeros that you can set and change and switch between to, to run your code. And so it's very important to have um, a, a device to know how many steps there are in the switch. Okay, so we've proven uniqueness. Um, okay, so you basically cannot have this possibility if the one orbit is bigger than the other one and therefore you cannot have two orbits. Questions here before I go on? Okay, um, please look at the previous lecture to make that argument for the existence solid because it's going to come back when we do, at, do the, um, or the idea is at least is going to come back when we look at the chaos next week as well. Okay, so now we've looked at the case when we have fixed points, two fixed points, when I is less than one, you have two fixed points. When I is greater than 1, we showed you have no fixed points in the limit cycle. And what we also showed in the last lecture is that one of the fixed points was a saddle. And so there's going to be a transition between the two. Okay? And that transition is going to take place in terms of the homoclinic bifurcation. So let's now begin with I greater than 1. We decrease I. Okay? Uh, and we see what happens. Okay, so at some i less than 1, what's going to happen is that um, your damping is going to overwhelm your torque. So remember what happened when we had a pendulum that was in this state, and we added damping, right? We showed that eventually it would oscillate slower and slower and slower. Eventually it would get up here, it would fall down, and it would go to the fixed point. So what is happening in this thing where we're driving it, and the reason why we can have a limit cycle even though we have damping, is that we have damping that slows the thing down, but we also have this, person, this thing that's driving it, and that this, the magnitude of what the driving is is given by I. And we showed that drive it fast enough, you're basically going to have an oscillation at the rate you're putting in energy to drive it. And so what happens now is 
it's almost like, kind of like swinging a bucket. Eventually your arm gets tired and you swing it slower and slower and slower, and there's eventually going to be a point at which it, the, the, the damping is going to overwhelm, it's going to go to a fixed point, and this is what happens over here. Okay, so at that point the rotation is lost and you have a homoclinic bifurcation, and so what happens is that bifurcation takes place at the saddle connection. Okay, and the point, the special number IH at which it occurs, um, we're going to call basically the critical value. And as I mentioned, when we looked at the homoclinic bifurcation, very often you can only get this numerically. You can get estimates of it, but it's actually, there are very few analytic examples that make it exact. So what I want to do now, okay, is simply show you a progression of phase diagrams of what actually happens. Okay, so I'm first going to start with I, greater, I equals to 1.1, okay? So what I've drawn here, and it's, it's sort of to augment what you have in Strogatz, right? Because in Strogatz, in the textbooks, it, it actually gives you the picture where you're just stuck between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, so look at both of them. They are actually the same picture. So what I've got here is my y-axis up here, and then phi, I haven't gone modulo to 2 pi, right? This, this is my radian, so 20 is like 20 divided by 6. Um, so I've got at least 6 pi in here. Okay. No? Yeah, I've got at least 6 pi in there. Um, so you can see what happens is basically for i greater than 1, the limit cycle is this special trajectory that lies in between these things, which is basically the trajectory that attracts all the other orbits. And we show that it exists, all orbits enter the trapping region, and that it is unique, okay? And so we have our stable limit cycle over here. And so what happens now when, and also the null line lies up here. So as we decrease i lower and lower, our fixed points form. And remember, the fixed points form in a, um, a pair, which was also derived in the previous lecture, uh, a stable node and a saddle. And the fixed points form, when this null line crosses the null line over here, which is basically y equals to zero. So when we have i equals to 0 0.9, we form the fixed points in our saddle node bifurcation over here. So there's the saddle, there's the stable node. But at the same time, the limit cycle can still exist. Okay, so this is very similar to the pendulum. We had the case where you could both go round in the conservative pendulum. The conservative pendulum, you remember, you had the case where you could both go round like this, and you could have this oscillatory behavior, and you could have a, a fixed point. Here... You can't go around at any velocity. You have this fixed limit cycle that's dependent on your parameters which the system chooses. But at the same time, so any phase space that starts with y greater than the null line up here will, will go to the limit cycle. If you're below it, you will go either to the limit cycle or if, you're clo if y is small enough, you'll go to the fixed point or you'll go to the saddle which will then kick you out either to the limit cycle or to the fixed point. Okay, so basically just below, and so I equals to 1 is a saddle node bifurcation for certain parameters. You have two fixed points close together just after the, no the birth of the saddle node bifurcation, so here the two are, and they coexist with the limit cycle, so you have a two-state system. You can either in your limit cycle or you can go to your fixed points. So let's what ha see what happens as you decrease i further. And remember, I said whenever you have a homoclinic bifurcation, you must watch this unstable manifold of your saddle. That's the very important thing. Because when this unstable manifold no longer kicks out and goes to the limit cycle, then you have the potential for a bifurcation. So let's watch it slowly disappear. Okay, so when I get equal to 0 0.7, right, 
your null client that for has come even closer. In fact, when your i is equal to 0 0.7, you have this null client that goes down, crosses over here, remember, goes below, crosses up. Okay? And remember, your limit cycle is always contained within the region where your null client is. So here you still have a limit cycle, okay, but it's becoming very, very close to the fixed point. Okay, so this picture basically has the same topology as the previous one. It's just showing you how it's getting closer. Okay, your fixed points basically have moved further and further apart, right? Your stable fixed point. So there's a bigger region that's going to your stable fixed point, which is to anticipate it, right? You're keeping your damping the same and you're decreasing the driving. And so what's going to happen is I said, watch this unstable manifold up there. You've got to look at this unstable manifold. It's going to your limit cycle. But you can see the moment it actually hits the saddle again, then you destroy your limit cycle. And that's when the um, homoclinic bifurcation takes place. So here we have, in this particular example, we have where we below, so it's actually quite tricky to find IH. We find I is below, it's equal to 0 0.5, so that's actually below IH. And what has happened is your unstable manifold goes, it looks as if it's going to hit a limit cycle, but actually when it returns, it returns before the saddle, right? So you've passed your homoclinic bifurcation. Your homoclinic bifurcation would take place when the unstable manifold goes all the way and hits the saddle again, okay? So um, IH is bigger than 0 0.5. So over here it's hit this trajectory, it bends back round and it goes to the fixed point and we've destroyed our limit cycle. Very, very important in application, right? So, and the, the importance of application comes with the physical consequences that it means, right? So, you can now have your two parameters, your I, your driving, and your damping. It's the interchange of the two. And you can draw a bifurcation diagram for them. And so let's actually do it. So um, you have alpha here, so that's your damping. If your damping is very, very strong, right, you're going to have only two possibilities. You're either going to have your stable limit cycle, if your driving overwhelms it, and that stable limit cycle is going to stick very, very close to your null line, um, and, or you can have a stable fixed point. You can have no other option. Um, if, however, your, dry, your damping is weak, what you're going to do is you're going to, suppose you start with I greater than 1, you always have your stable limit cycle, and then you're going to form over here at I equals to 1, you always have the saddle node bifurcation, okay? So that's the, the dotted line over here. And then you have that state that I showed you in the previous two diagrams where you have both a limit cycle and you have your two stable fixed points, or your, your two fixed points, the one is a saddle and the one's unstable. And so that's the regime over here. And then when you decrease your driving in the further, the possibility no longer exists that you have your limit cycle. You destroy your limit cycle in the homoclinic bifurcation, and then you just have a stable fixed point. Questions? Okay, so this is basically the bifurcation plot in your I alpha parameter space. It's an important one, because what they've done is the technolog technological implications for the Joseph's injunction is huge because it makes the switch that you're going to be able to switch on very, very quickly. And the way you make the switch is simply looking at the actual device's equations in the right way. Okay? And I'm just going to say a little about this. It's not so important for purposes, but it's very, very useful for the technological implications. So the main thing I want you to do is to be able to do the analysis tools that I've mentioned previously. But for technology to watch, especially now that we've got that um, room temperature superconductor, I mean, this is, this is like a different realm of society. If you want to go investing, okay, and 
you see companies coming up with new technology, it's at least worthwhile to try and understand whether they're going to actually make it possible or not. Because the first company to make a really fast computer, um, it's, it's going to be a new advance. I mean, there's always, there's been this curve, like there's this law where technology always, the speed of computing increases. And the reality is, it's hit a bit of a plateau in the last couple of years, right? Because there's a limit on the chip sizes you can make, there's a limit on the switching speed. This thing removes the limit on the switching speed. Yes, Moore's Law. So this is a way of defeating it. Like taking the next massive big jump because the switching speed increases, right? So what they've been doing is they're putting fewer and fewer things on a chip. Okay, that's one way of making a computer faster. Another way is being, ma being able, given the, the things you have, is to make computations in a much smaller time scale. Um, so it's at least something to watch. Okay, so this is not so strict rigorously for exam purposes, but it's simply for social enrichment, I think, I guess. At least, no, you know, sort of seeing what potentially steers the future. So why this is important, okay? And the importance comes because you have, if you're working with a Josephson junction, when we work with current, the only thing computer science cares about is basically your voltage. You want to switch, we either voltage on, voltage off. And how you make that of the Josephson junction, it needs a bit of argument, but here it is. Okay, so the idea is, remember right two lectures ago, we said our voltage is related to the time derivative of this phase of the Josephson junction multiplied by some constants. Okay, so that's actually what the thing we have to look at. And another thing, the idea, when we're working with these rapidly oscillating currents, we often don't measure the oscillating current. So for example, you know that limit cycle that we had? The important thing is not the oscillations, but the average value of the voltage at that limit, of the limit cycle over there. And so we're going to define VDC to be the average value of the voltage. So for example, for the limit cycle, it would be the average value of where that limit cycle is. And so we can actually work out what it is, OK? It's simply the average value of phi dot, okay? And we can work out the average value of phi dot because we have the graph, okay? And in fact, the average value of phi dot is just 2 pi times the period of the limit cycle, okay? And we, have, we can work out the period of the limit cycle. You simply take that limit cycle, just as we did for the relaxation oscillations, integrated the time it takes to complete the limit cycle. And so if you do that, um, well, maybe you go on before. So this is for the Josephson junction, but also when we're working with a pendulum, that phi dot is the average torque of the pendulum, right? What's swinging the pendulum around? Okay, just to give you some intuition if you prefer to think about the pendulum. Okay, so we're going to look at this thing, this VDC, which is simply one over the period of the pendulum, and that is the thing that acts as a switch, right? The voltage is the thing we measure, we put them in, we can put them out. If you take a device and you find the voltage as a certain value, like one or two or zero, that's your switch. And so what this thing does is if we draw what our one over period is as a function of I, which is the driving current, what we get is something like that, okay? So what I'm basically drawing here is one over the period versus the applied current. And so here we see that, remember, the applied current is zero. Um, sorry, the, the, uh, the voltage that you measure, and therefore the period, is zero at the fixed point, okay? So here's our fixed point. Our fixed point always disappears, and that we got from the previous two lectures of analysis, when I is bigger than one. Okay, so there is the place where the fixed point disappears. But before it, and then at that point, you're always going to go to the limit cycle. And so your voltage measurement is going to jump from one to basically being proportional to one over the period of the limit cycle when it is born. Okay, increase the current more, it will just increase. But decrease the current, remember, just as we described the bifurcation, you're going to decrease it along here, 
and eventually you're going to hit your homoclinic bifurcation and you are going to go to the point over here and this is your IH where your homoclinic bifurcation takes place. So you have a device in a Josephson junction in which you can have zero voltage or you can have one voltage. You have a way by changing I to change the state between zero or one. And you have a way of reading it, right? Because you simply put a voltmeter on. You can read it all the time. So you effectively have a memory, like a memory device with a Josephson junction for the sole, by the sole reason that it has this hysteresis built into its dynamical system. You have a memory device and a pendulum too, right? You can have a whole bunch of guys swinging their pendulums and you can take a photograph of the one swinging around, the other one's hanging still, it's either chip zero or one. Their arms are going to get tired. Same with the Josephson junction. And the advantages is you need to supply very little voltage to make the thing work. It switches very, very rapidly. Up until now, the only thing that's been stopping it from actually being used industrially was one, you had to cool the superconductors down. Um, the other thing that's stopping it is the size of the device. So that you're going to see them and making it practical and putting a whole bunch of them together. So they're going to work on that now. But the moment, but now that they have superconductors that work at room temperature, there's very little that's going to stop them from trying to make it as small as possible. In some sense, the race is on for a quantum computer. The very fact that makes it work is the dynamical system properties that you've been looking at now. So there's, there's a nice transition between the actual application and understanding the fundamentals that actually drives the dynamical systems behind it. That's all for me for today. Questions? No. Um, let me stop there.